Um, thank you. So we'll call the meeting to order. I'm calling it to order at 5.07 p.m. If we can all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, Biggie, if you and the team can lead in the Goethe Pledge. As a citizen of the world, I will follow Goethe's circle of learning. Curiosity opens my mind, ideas lead to knowledge, responsible choices show respect. Cooperation strengthens others. Learners are courageous. Empathy creates community. Als ein Bürger dieser Welt folge ich dem Kreis des Lernens. Neugierig, ideenreich, respektvoll, kooperativ, mutig, empathisch. Como ciudadano del mundo, seguiré el círculo del aprendizaje. Creatividad, ideas, respeto, colaboración, valor, empatía. Thank you. Let's move to the roll call. Is Yasir here yet? Uh, Frank? Yes. Um, I think you're still on mute, but we know you're here. Yes. Uh, Pete? Great. Thank uh, you. I'm here as well. Great. Uh, we have news from Katrin that she's not able to join, so we'll mark her as absent, and I am present. Um, I'd like to move the agenda as presented. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Frank. Um, let's take a, a vote, Frank. Yes. Pete. Yes. I also approve. Um, let's move to item three, public comment on general items in the board's jurisdiction. Casey. The public may comment on any item that is on the agenda or any other item that is in the board's jurisdiction. Members of the public who wish to comment during the board meeting may use the raise hand tool on the Zoom platform or raise their hand if attending in person. Individual comments will be limited to three minutes and the total time for this purpose shall not exceed 30 minutes per meeting. If an interpreter is needed for comments, they will be translated to English and the time limit shall be six minutes. Individuals may speak one time per subject. The Board of Trustees reserves the right to mute or remove a member of the public if comments or actions disrupt the board meeting. Board members are prohibited from responding to or commenting on matters raised by the public that are not on the agenda. And do we have members of the public present who wish to speak? Um, yes, we do. Yes. Uh, All right. Yeah. Oh, well, my name's Jennifer, and I'm giving my three minutes to Tim. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Jen, and everyone for joining. Um, uh, so my name is Tim uh, Shea. My daughters both go to Goethe. They are in <clears throat> fourth grade and kindergarten. Um, I've been, so I've been working with Chris Jones, uh, former, I guess, executive director, um, since 2019. Um, I just took a look at all of our correspondence in the last couple of days. Um, so I first I first spoke with Chris Jones about the security situation at the school back in 2019, um, and then more seriously in the last two years. Um, and so in looking through the correspondences, what I found was our initial course, our initial connection, our initial email to Chris, where <clears throat> one day I went to pick up my kids and I was able to walk onto campus without any like no one asked me anything. I just walked on. I could wander around campus and go go wherever I wanted to. And I brought this up to Chris as like a really big concern, especially in the wake of um, the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. Um, so uh, Chris was very gracious. Uh, he initiated a, a meeting and a plan and he talked about making sure doors were closed and there were visitor passes administered and were mandatory. And then we had upgraded video equipment for the school. He was very uh, proactive about coming up with a recommendation. Um, the problems we ran into were that there were additional uh, breaches. There were additional uh, times where the door was left wide open or then I could walk in at any, any point or I watched other parents uh, walked in where one time at valet, there was a, a homeless man sitting at the valet um, having like a manic episode, at like 730 in the morning with a bunch of five and six and seven year olds, you know, exiting their cars. Um, and so um, I raised these things again with Chris, and then I, I included Casey and Biggie on all of the threads. 
And I, I flagged this as an extremely, extremely urgent problem that I felt was not being taken seriously. Um, I also um, expressed my frustration with LAUSD specifically, who seemed to be stonewalling an effort to upgrade the cameras um, at the school. We talked about how easy it would be to order a camera off of like Amazon and just glue it to the door and fix another problem with the security. Um, and LAUSD sat on the request. Um, it's been, uh, we thought maybe it would be one week, maybe it would be a month, maybe it would be two months at the worst case scenario. But it has now been almost 19 months where LAUSD has sat on this request. Um, so luckily in that time, we were we set up a, a safety committee with parents, a mix of parents and administrators. Um, the board was gracious enough to hire and fund and hire a hall monitor, which plugged a huge security hole between the gate and the office, uh, which was a great um, idea. But again, this was followed by additional breaches of security. Uh, the door was left open, people would walk in and out. And still to this day, uh, there's been no um, there's been no camera installed. And we found out on the safety committee meeting a few uh, weeks ago, um, which was on um, January 31st, um, that a security camera had been delivered, but that there was still no date established for the um, for the install, which I think is egregious. I think it has gone gone beyond absurdity um, that the school can't plug up um, a hole that big. In fact, um, I think that it is negligent on the case of the school district. Um, I'm sure all of you guys have read, being in education, uh, the U.S. Department of Justice just published a 600-page report on the fallout from the Uvalde school shooting <clears throat> um, and the ensuing $27 billion dollar class action lawsuit, $27 billion class action lawsuit, which I quoted and, and sent to Chris and Casey and Biggie. Um, and and um, where it talked about things like who was named in the lawsuit and why people were named in the lawsuit for having plans in place to protect the kids and failing to enact them. So the principal of the school of Uvalde, Texas was named in a $27 billion class action lawsuit for negligence, what amounts to negligence. And what I see the problem with LAUSD is they're, they're, they're fat and they're bureaucratic. And this is the sort of like modus operandi um, with how they, um, with how they behave and how quickly they behave. And I realize we're in one of the largest school districts probably in the country. I have to imagine LA County is 12 million people is bigger than any other school district in the country. And so uh, I imagine like a map of Los Angeles. Um, I imagine these sort of like red dots all over the map of Los Angeles, each dot representing um, a scumbag uh, ambulance chasing lawyer. Each dot representing one of those people where if there was an assault at the school, right? If there was an assault at the school, can you imagine all of these scumbag ambulance chasing lawyers swarming around the school, foaming at the mouth, just dying to get a statement from somebody about where there was impropriety or where there was negligence. There was negligence, thank you for the, the notice, where there was negligence at play. And so I sent uh, Biggie and Casey a, a notice. I sent um, Samantha uh, an email with a, with a big summary of this about my my requests for the school or for the board. Um, I would like to, the safety committee and the board to review all of the correspondence, all of it, the emails, the phone calls, the notes, everything to see if there is an impropriety at play. Um, <clears throat> I would like to see the clause in our contract with the district that describes that we are not supposedly not able to do maintenance on the door. I'd like to see it. Um, and given that the board uh, has counsel, I'm aware that the board has counsel, um, I would like to hear a point of view from the board, from the board. I expect to hear uh, something from the board um, and um, about our leverage with the city and what we plan to do next. So that's all. Thanks, Tim. And I believe that concludes um, any other public comment at this time. Thanks, Casey. Um, and thanks, Tim. As you're aware, we have a safety up.
the school safety update on a on an agenda point later. And so we'll be hearing more about this from the leadership. And we appreciate the time you took to come here and we have your um, items recorded. So we'll um, follow our, our whatever process we have to, to continue this path. Thank you. Great. I look forward to hearing from everyone. Thank you. Great. Thank Bye. you. Thanks for coming. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. Happy Bye. celebration. All right. Um, you see, I see you're with us. Do you want to pick up at consent items? Sure. I'd like to make a motion to approve the regular board meeting minutes of January 22nd, 2024. All in favor? Frank? Yes. yes. Sam? Yes. Pete? Yes. And Katrin, I do not see, but uh, all right, so the motion passes. Uh, all right. Yes, uh, yes. Pat Patrin is not able to attend this meeting, so it's only going to be the four of you. Okay. All right, then uh, let's start with the leadership team report. Okay, as always, we're starting with an enrollment update, which is um, really good news because our enrollment holds stable at 442 students. So the same as what we had last month at the end of the month. Um, and uh, that means we're 12 students over budget. We have a budgeted ADA of 95%. And there also we are over budget with 95.9% at the end of month five. Um, in the meantime, we've started accepting lottery applications that happened um, right after we came back from winter break on January 8th or since January 8th. And we have received as of Friday last week, 143 applications. Um, when we had the last board meeting, that was three weeks ago, we had 76 applications. So 67 more now, which means almost double in the last uh, three weeks. And as you can see here, the main entry points are obviously TK and K and also sixth grade, but we have a um, very interesting phenomenon with the uh, high numbers in third grade, which might be because we have the language um, acquisition option starting in third grade, which means students that didn't have German before they come to our school can still come there because they can choose to have their core instruction in English language and only take German as an acquisition language. Um, and that starts in third grade. So um, it looks like people realize that and it makes third grade an another entry point for the um, school. And that's just what we've had before. And it did not change from last month, the 442 students um, with pretty much 25 students on average in every class with um, eighth grade being a little lower and TK being a little lower, but um, and fourth grade a little higher. But on average, it's pretty much mm -hmm. the 25 students that we usually use when we um, put our budget together. Um, and for our staffing update, um, no real big changes from the last time that we met to talk about staffing. We still have those open full-time teaching positions that are currently being filled by substitutes and continue to go well. Um, and because of that, we also still have the um, open IA position that is also currently being covered by a substitute as well. Um, the update that we have for this month is with the additional RSP teacher or the resource specialist um, with, for a part-time position. We went through some interviews over the last month um, and have a very promising candidate um, after completing interviews and demo lessons. So we're in the process of looking at references um, and hope to be able to fill this position um, in the coming days. Um, as far as Prop 39 goes, we received our preliminary offer for the 24-25 school year. That preliminary offer always comes in on February 1st. 
The offer is based on 349.44 in-district classroom ADA, which means the district did not um, go with our calculation of 356 um, ADA. They had um, sent us the letter, the objection letter uh, in December. We had responded in January, but they um, kept their own calculation. So the offer is based on their calculation. They are offering us our current footprint of 17 classroom, two special education spaces and two administrative spaces. Um, you all know that we actually occupy 19 classrooms, but those two extra classrooms are below the line classrooms that we have negotiated in exchange for certain shared spaces. So we have, um, um, given up spaces like the library or the parent center or um, the Margaret's Place room, uh, things that we could have um, shared use um, of, but we said it doesn't make sense. And therefore we were able to negotiate two extra classrooms. This current year we have 47% shared use space. Next year, our offer is actually for 50% of shared use space. So it's um, a good chance that we will be able to negotiate again, additional classroom space through an alternative agreement. Um, the, uh, the cost for the facilities square footage wise has increased. Currently we pay $11 and 18 cents and next year the um, um, amount is calculated with a 13.22 um, cost per square footage. And the next step now is that we respond to that offer by March 1st. We will respond that um, we accept those classrooms and that we would like to enter into negotiations to um, to get an alternative agreement for more classroom space. Um, and then by um, May, for, uh, sorry, by April 1st, uh, the district gives us the final offer that we have to accept by May 1st. Um, now we would like to give um, a short update on this co-location policy that the um, Board of Education is working on, actually not the Board of Education, the district, the superintendent with a whole big bunch of people, uh, legal and otherwise, is working on the policy on the request of the Board of Education. We had talked about this earlier and um, there are two members of the Board of Education who have um, um, brought forward a resolution um, in June or even before June of last year. And um, the district, when the resolution passed, the uh, superintendent and his big bunch of people were tasked to create a policy out of what that resolution um, entails. And the, that draft policy was introduced at the meeting of the committee of the whole on January 30th, Casey and I went to the meeting um, and the policy that was introduced um, is not as bad as it could have been, but it still clearly states, and that's what I've put here, um, that the district avoids Proposition 39 co-locations um, on schools that are school sites with this, um, where it's a district priority school, a BSAP. BSAP is Black Student Achievement um, Plan School and or a community school. And that is what is relevant for us because Marina Del Rey Middle School is all three of those. They are regardless regarded as a priority school, they are regarded as a BSAP school and a community school. So theoretically, um, the um, Prop 39 unit was asked to already for this year, um, bring that policy into place. 
Um, but since the timing works out in our favor, our pre uh, preliminary offer is still on this campus, which possibly for next year, it could be not on this campus anymore due to the um, district's um, hope or district's mandate to not put co-locations on such school campuses. And, um, mm -hmm. and what is very clear is that the policy is going to pass tomorrow. The meeting is tomorrow. Um, and it is also clear that there are definitely three board of education, sorry, four board of education members that will vote for it, two that will vote against it, and one is still up in the air. But no matter how that one person is going to vote, it's going to go through and the policy will pass. So CCSA has had a lot of advocacy efforts in place over the last few months. And now in specific for tomorrow, they have put um, out that people should attend the board meeting, obviously. Um, dressed in blue, we were told, because the um, UTLA is um, planning a big um, protest or celebration, you can call it as you wish, um, at three o'clock uh, in the afternoon when the board um, discusses this matter and will then also vote on the matter. Um, Charter schools were asked to make public comment at the meeting tomorrow. They were asked to write individual letters to the superintendent, board members, um, Prop 39, and also to call board members. Um, in an effort to um, build some opposition for possibly later time. Everybody knows that this policy is going to pass tomorrow. But um, but there are already um, plans in place or hopes in place that with a different board of education, which could happen this fall because there are four board seats open for um, election, two of them being um, uh, people who run again, but two of them being completely new um, candidates because the two candidates of those two board districts are retiring. So once those four board of education members are in place, there might be a different way of approaching this policy. It might be that it can be revised. It might be that it can be um, taken back. So all this is what CCSA is already um working on for not just now, but for later also. Um, maybe since this is a very um, specific topic, if you would like to ask questions now, we can do it or we can do it at the end of the presentation. Um, I, I'm okay with if you do it now. Okay. Are there any questions about our offer or this co-location policy? So did you say, I'm sorry, did you say our calculation was 356? Correct. Yeah, so there's no there is seven 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 uh, students. Two. We had calculated seven students more mm. as um attending our school. And the calculation was made on the basis of sixth grade students that we expect to come, but mm. we didn't have these intent to enroll forms to prove that they will come. We were just going off of the um, of the statistics of students, how many have applied in the last years. And we said we could show that there were always more students applying, but they only took into calculation what we actually had intent to enroll forms for. Mm. Okay, I mean, but seven seven students wouldn't have, made, wouldn't have made a difference in the calculation, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, Biggie, my, you can continue. I don't think there are any other questions. I, I have a question on the, the co-location oh, policy. No, no worries. Um, 
So if I understand it, the co-location policy is supposed to not impact existing charters or not impact existing co-locations, but is to guide the board on granting of future co-locations. Has that changed or is that still part of it? And then a follow-up, I, I also understand, and I don't know if CCSA is working on this at all, that there are, are questions about there remain additional questions about whether or not the way that this could be implemented would be aligned with California law of providing access to the district's buildings. And so are those both still things that are, are, are there questions about that right now? Or, it, are, or, you know, is this kind of a sequential, we'll have to wait and see what happens type issue? So I think um, from a perspective of um, that they said that it would not impact existing co-locations, I think that's why we got the offer that we got for the moment. However, at that last meeting, um, it was made very, very clear that um, the a lot of board members there think that charter schools impact the the possibility of the district, if it's a school that is in any of these three categories, that the, that the um, possibility or the option of the district to actually teach those students that are in these schools um, in a manner that is um, conduce conducive to their learning is very majorly impacted by charter schools being on their campuses because they have to take care of um, of the politics between two schools. They have to share their spaces when they would have um, itinerants coming in and helping students with tutoring and all sorts of things. So, so it seemed to me pretty clear that for this year, um, they are holding on to the um, what they've said before that they would not touch existing co-locations, but I did not get the safe feeling that this is the same moving forward. The, the language in the draft policy that they shared at the um, committee meeting of the whole earlier this month um, left room for a variety of situations that could impact schools that are currently co-located on priority or BSAP or community schools. So while the what has been said and what the policy was written for was that it wouldn't disrupt currently co-located schools, there was kind of that language that allowed for caveats to that. Um, and that's, I think, what Biggie is referring to, in addition to the um, board members' comments during that committee meeting of the whole that um, does not fill us with a lot of confidence for future years down the line outside of this coming year. Okay, thank you. And then it, with the um, legal aspects um, for California law and access, um, CCSA, that is absolutely something that they are focusing on. And that's, um, as Biggie was saying, the advocacy efforts are at this point not to stop the policy from being approved, but to better prepare schools um, in the future if there are things that happen that um, don't match with um, California law. But, but CCA, CCA, CCSA is not challenging the, um, the directive by itself at this stage or later on, or are they preparing? Do you think they're I think they are not challenging it because it's very clearly a board vote. And um, and at this point, the Board of Education is just um, unfortunately um, not charter school friendly. Yeah, so Vicky, I get that, but like, but the legality of the, you know, the legality. So it, so CCSA's assessment is that the board has the authority to enact such a directive, um, and how, that's and that's why I they're not. It. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. No more questions? We're good? All right. Go ahead, Biggie. 
Um, this is just um, what we do every year, the Form 700, which is um, the, the transparency for the public that um, board members always act in the best interest of the public and not in the interest of their own um, personal financial gain. So um, board members and in our case, uh, Casey and I have to compare complete a form 700 every year, which um, states that we wouldn't have any advantage or that we don't get any um, financial advantage by um, uh, doing our job here. And um, the board of trustees um, gets those emails sent directly from the LA County Board of Supervisors. Um, and those form 700s are sent to your Goethe email address. So some of you don't always use the Goethe email address for our um, communication. So please, for this one, um, check your Goethe email address um, and look out for this Form 700. You should already have received it, and it's due by April 2nd. Um, I will remind you um, because we get a notification if not everyone has submitted the completed form. At this point, I'm just making you aware of it. And um, obviously the sooner you can do it, the better, then we can leave it behind us. But um, I will keep reminding you until April 2nd when the form is due. Yeah, and this is the um, update on the school safety and specifically the school safety committee. As Tim has already um, mentioned, we have a school safety committee. Um, Chris um, initiated it, I'd say a good year ago, um, after Tim had reached out to him many times. Um, and since then, the school safety committee has met regularly to make sure that um, the school campus is safe. Um, as you probably recall, um, Chris had brought forward a few items for your approval, one of them being to hire a campus safety monitor. Um, that's the person that watches that big long hallway from the buzzer gate to the um, main office and also um, um, a walkway that goes basically in 90 degrees to that um, buzzer gate office line. Um, and uh, also the board approved that we would get a camera that is um, installed, not installed, that is in a, uh, in a temporary um, case that is monitoring that walkway, that hallway. Um, so both those things have been done. However, and we and and I think we have made um, really good progress regarding the on-campus safety during the day because that campus safety monitor has made a big impact on safety in the restrooms, safety of the students going from one place to the other, especially our middle school students. Um, and then also monitoring the hallway from the buzzer gate to the um, office. However, what we've faced lately, unfortunately also a little bit due to the rain, is the challenge that the buzzer gate still has this outdated camera system that Tim spoke about. And um, we have not been able to get LAUSD here to actually mount that camera system. Um, we have the cameras in the meantime, they are actually sitting in our main office. And I have um, put together on these next three slides, basically the timeline of when things happened and how LAUSD um, um, went about it because we first asked for an alterations request so that we could mount or a, a camera could be mounted. Then they came back and said, well, every um, campus gets new cameras. And then they came back, but first campuses are taken care of that have no cameras at all. 
before they take care of campuses that have cameras, but they are outdated. Then they came back with supply chain delays for installations and so on and so forth. At the moment, we have three cameras sitting in our shelf here in the office, and we're waiting for them to give us the green light for the installation. Now, what happened just last week is that we got an email that they are now saying that they need to, in order to install the cameras, they need to um, remove a whole gate um, and make it, I guess, not a gate that opens opens anymore, but a fixed gate um, so that the camera can be installed there. And that's where we stand as of last Thursday, that the um, the CPM has to um, confirm with the administration at Marina Del Rey that they are allowed to close or remove that gate, make it a fixed um, um, side. It's not a gate anymore, but a fixed fence basically, um, where they then can install that camera. As a school, we are not allowed under Prop 39 to do any installation ourselves. So as a mean in the meantime um, solution, we have bought a ring camera and there is a case and it will be hopefully mounted tomorrow because um, the, ca the case is being delivered. It's a case that can be mounted on the bars of the gate so that it's not permanently mounted, but just put on there. Then the camera goes in there and then you can um, close it up from the back so that the camera cannot be stolen. But the camera would give us at least um, a good um, vision of the area around the buzzer gate so that we could um, check on that However, it would obviously not be connected to the buzzing. So the buzzing would still be the old outdated system, um, but we would have more overview and a better, better visibility of the area around the buzzer gate through that ring camera. Um, so that's our status as of right now. I've been emailing back and forth with them. I've had conversations on the phone. It, it there is not much more that we can do um, with regard to LAUSD um, and their way of handling these um, requests for installation of, um, of permanent um, items um, that always has to go through that alterations request. But um, yeah, I, I don't know if you probably have questions, please feel free to ask. Um... Uh, Frank, questions, comments? I like the idea with the workaround on uh, the non-permanent case. Uh, and my question is, what are the consequences if we were to, you know, is there, are there any con consequences for us going forward with the non-permanent installation? No. Okay, good. Non permanent then. installation. We could put multiple of these cameras as so long let's as do we it. can take them off. And um, as I said, the only thing is it's just supervision because it's not connected mm -hmm. to any ringing because we cannot wire anything like the yeah. ring camera it, that you it. have at got your it. house is different. I got it. So, no, no problem here. Thank you. That answers all my questions. Sam. Yeah, I have a question about the, the permanent camera issue. So if the school district's solution is that that buzzer gate needs to no longer be a gate and just a gate with a camera, it's how two, does that address? The buzzer gate has two gates. Right now you can open both sides. And I think from what I understand, they would make the one side a stable fence type thing so that you can just open the one side to come in and out and on the other side they would mount the camera so that it okay. has also more um, angle compared to the camera that is there right now that's on the side of both of those gates got it okay because i 
I, it sounded like the solution was to to get rid of the gate, but, no, but it's only no. get rid of the, the, one the of the one gates. Part, and so we would the, still have yeah. the buster gate with a camera. Okay, yes. good. Okay. Um, but yes, I, I support as long as there's no downside for us moving forward in the interim with the, the non-permanent solution until the camera gets installed, I, I say definitely move forward with that. Uh, Pete? Um, couple of comments and questions. Uh, so so I, I think one thing that we ought to be doing is sending them a, a, a weekly, whoever them is, a weekly email asking for a status just to ensure that, that it's clear that the delay isn't on our part and we've done our due diligence. Um, you know, and it can just be the same email. You just keep resending it and just change the date. Um, the other thing is, so, so not to be the, uh, my, my typical gray cloudness and the silver lining, but when, when statements like, um, that the hall monitor has been very impactful are made instantly, I think, what does very impactful mean? Uh, and I'd like to see some sort of something that, that tells me what, what, what that is rather than simply it's impactful. So you don't have to do that now. You can come back next time and give some examples or, or some data that tells us that it's actually impactful. And, and to that end, um, I understand there's a problem with the with the buzzer uh, not being connected to the ring camera, but ring cameras do afford you the ability to talk to people on the other end of the ring camera. So it's not as if it's not useful in that way. And the second thing is, uh, how how much is that gate used in a day? A lot. A lot. That's, that's so, the so, that's pretty much the single entry entry point and exit point outside of the morning drop off and the afternoon pickup. So so is is it possible um, that the I mean we have this hall monitor. Can the hall monitor be there or keep an eye on the gate and open the gate or inform somebody that through a walkie talkie or something? I mean, can they be useful in some manner with this gate? They could technically, but that would mean that they cannot do anything else but that because the gate is from a from from a distance perspective too far off of where the, the hall monitor is otherwise positioned to have a, a, a strategic view on multiple um, uh, areas. So if you put that hall monitor right to the gate, then she would be standing there all day long and not doing anything else. Right. So, so I mean, she, 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 presumably she can move, but... Um... So, I mean, maybe there is some solution at certain times where she can be assisting in some way. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe it takes some thought. I mean, if, if it's not possible at all, then I guess not. But it seems we have this person and they should be able to do something to assist with that, it seems like. Like in low periods or lunch or, yeah. you know, if if everybody's out in the yard anyway, then she doesn't need to be monitoring and she could be doing the gate or I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know all the minute by minute details, but I mean, if there's some opportunity for, for her to multitask, then I, I think we should take advantage of it. Yeah. That was it. All right. Uh, if there's nothing further, uh, moving on to the finance committee report. I'd like to make a motion to approve the financials for January 2024. Do I have a second? I second. It's from Frank. Go ahead. Um, uh, Ryan, is Ryan here? Oh, there he is. Yeah, Ryan is here. Hi, all. Um, Biggie, do I have permission to share my screen? Yes. Uh, you should have, yeah. Give me one second here.
All right. Can everybody see that okay? Yeah, great. Okay, so these are our financials through January 2024. January is a significant month because it marks our second interim reporting period um, for LAUSD. So these financials are our second interim financials that will be submitted to the district in their template. Looking at enrollment, we have actual data through month five. So we ended month five with 442 students, which is great. We continue to have a higher enrollment than budgeted. And um, our students are coming at a higher rate than budgeted as well. So we budgeted for a 95% average daily attendance rate this year, and we're coming in just about at 96%, just under there. Um, so that's, that's a plus. And the additional revenue generated through this higher ADA is uh, providing us with more funding for the year. So uh, looking at the income statement, we are looking at higher LCFF, our local control funding formula of about four, uh, 46K. Our state revenue is coming in 110,000 higher than budget, and that has to do with the timing of one-time funds, as well as additional uh, dollars generated through the higher enrollment. So um, in comparison to the previous month's presentation, this is about a $16,000 difference, um, positive, um, because as each month, um, as each month closes, we are realizing additional LCFF and ADA revenue. So our budget still has 430 students um, as our uh, budgeted number, and we haven't adjusted our forecast up. Rather, we are realizing the positive uh, additional revenue each month, um, and we have a 12-student buffer at this point in time. On the expense side, it's the same story as well. We have about a $13,000 difference from what we forecasted the previous month. And uh, the main driver for that positive uh, uh, variance from the previous month's presentation is uh, another month went by and we have additional realized savings um, from lower health and uh, welfare costs for the school year due to, um, due to lower certificated salaries and some open positions. All in all, our net income for this year is $210,000 forecasted as of now. And we anticipate that to continue to go up as each month goes by and we outperform our enrollment targets and we continue to experience some savings on the, on the uh, staffing and the benefit side. Now, one point of interest that the finance committee um, looks at always is the fact that this large net income is comprised of one-time funds. So in our key points, we I just want to remind everyone that this budget has $372,000 of one-time funds in here. Okay, so if those went away, we wouldn't have a net income of 200 and some thousand dollars. So um, this is broken down um, in the various buckets here with our largest uh, contributor being the Learning Recovery Block Grant. And that's money that can be spent all the way through 27-28. And one of the things that this um, that the Finance Committee has uh, been looking at as we approach year end is whether or not this board wants to maybe consider not utilizing so much of the one-time funds this school year and perhaps utilize the, utilizing them in the future year's budget where um, our state funding doesn't look so great from the governor's uh, proposal. Uh, of a, a COLA of less than 1% for next year. So that's something to think about, but we do wanna always point out that this net income does include a lot of one-time funding sources that aren't promised in the future years. On the balance sheet side, we ended uh, January with just under $3 million in the bank and we're projecting year-end cash of $2.6 million. Within this packet, we also have our notes to the financials, our income statement and balance sheet, 
which all roll up into the dashboard, which I discussed. And our check register that's filtered not by check number or, or issue date, but rather largest expense to smallest expense. And this was reviewed in detail at the finance committee and provided to the board members if anyone has a question around a disbursement. Um, but this was reviewed by the finance committee prior to this meeting. Nothing stood out as strange, unordinary, or non-budgeted. That concludes the January presentation, and now I can open it up for questions. Uh, any questions, Frank? No. Sam? So on the item that you mentioned about the, the one-time funding and the one that has the longer tail, will there be a recommendation from the finance committee come our next budget cycle or is there a request or consideration of changing something within the current budget cycle to preserve some of those funds for later years? Um, Frank, do you want to answer that or should I? We're going to we uh, we have uh, you know raised that we have raised that issue in the finance committee basically saying look you know if we can um, how 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 far can we stretch the funds in order to smooth out the uh, you know the increase uh, in cost you know and you know any other potential things which are unforeseen so that's was part of the discussion okay so we'll we'll await further yeah, um, recommendations I, 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 about this. I, I think the, the next step is that the, you know, that uh, the executive team has to come up, you know, they're going through the assumptions right now on the budget. What are the assumptions we're going in and, um, and they're developing an initial budget and then we have to see, you know, certain, you know, so we, we need to spend it by 27, 28 for the most part, right? Um, and, um, you know, certain, certain, you know, and, and develop a plan. Yeah. Pete? Nothing else for me, thanks. All right, all in favor to approve the 2020, January 2024 financials, Frank? Yes. Sam? Yes. Pete? Yes. That is a yes for me as well. Um, I have just been told that I'm gonna lose internet for a few minutes. So, Sam, is it okay if you continue? I'm going to just try to log back on real real quick. Yes. Um, right. Let's move to the next item under Finance Committee. That's the approval of the fiscal year 23-24 USD second interim report. I second. Oh, I move. Sorry. I'm sorry. I move. And, and then do we have a second? No second. Great. Uh, Ryan? Yes, thank you. I'm actually really excited about this because it's not normal that a board has the opportunity to actually approve this report before it's submitted. Um, you know, because the the timing never really quite uh, links up. But uh, with the help of your operations team and my team at XED, we were able to get all of the necessary information to close the month of January quickly and 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 accurately um, with enough time to actually populate the LAUSD template prior to this board meeting. So I, um, as I stated, these are our second interim financials. And on our income statement, I just wanted to point out that we're forecasting net income of 209,537 for year end. That's our projected year end number. Our budgeted number was 9,504, which was the same as our uh, preliminary budgeted target uh, net income. And our actual year to date net income is 553,000. And the reason why I'm highlighting those four is so that in the LAUSD template that you were provided, you can see our original budget of 9,504. Um, those tie in the template are actual to date $553,003.78 ties to what we have on our dashboard and our projected year end net income, 209,537. Uh, reconciles with what we reviewed on our dashboard 
and everything is in the template and ready to submit um, as soon as this board approves it. So we won't have to, um, I forget the terminology um, that we uh, ratify, right? Because we're approving after the fact, we're actually able to board approve this and submit it in the proper sequence. Um, so the ask today is for this board to approve the LAUSD second interim report. Thank you for bringing that excitement to us, Ryan. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, are there any questions about the report, Frank? Sorry, none. Uh, Pete? Not for me. Um, you see if you're still on? It looks like he's dropped. Um, and I don't have any other questions with that. So um, let's take it to a vote, Frank. Yes. Pete? Yes. And I approve as well. Thank you. Um, let's move to item C, the discussion of the governor's January budget proposal. And Ryan, this looks like it's also for you. Yes. So at this point in time, the governor's proposal doesn't look as favorable as what we've been used to over the last few years as far as the COLA increase for our revenue. So over the, the previous couple of years, we've realized um, some generous COLAs of around 8% or higher over the last two years. And this year, as it stands, the governor is proposing a percentage of less than 1% for next year. I believe it's a 0.71% COLA. And um, that's, uh, that's uh, disheartening, right? Because that uh, revenue increase is not on pace with expense increases that go up each year. So it's very prudent that we um, use this assumption as we go back and work on the budget for the 24-25 school year. And it's also one of the reasons why we've been discussing amongst ourselves in the finance committee meetings, um, whether or not it makes sense to defer the use of uh, some of the one-time funds to offset this lower COLA for next year so that we can maintain some of the uh, you know, expenses that we're used to, um, used to having. Um, so on the good news, uh, there is some funding sources that will continue. So we had a new funding source, Proposition 28 Arts Music in Schools. That is not a one-time funding source. That is something that is proposed to continue for 24-25 and, um, and onwards as it stands right now. Um, so that's helpful that that money will be returning. The other piece of good news is that the expanded learning opportunities program funding is um, is uh, on track to coming back next year as well. And remember, expanded learning opportunities program, um, we've had so many different acronyms lately. This is ELOP funding, and this is for uh, the program above and beyond the school day. So this would handle after schools, summer school expenses, winter school expenses, anything outside of the regular school day. So that, that money is returning and it's something that we've been utilizing for our sports programs and other um, extracurricular items. Um, so the good news is that's here to stay. Arts and music is returning again. Um, and we're just hoping that this COLA uh, isn't as, as low as it seems, but we're planning for it on the finance committee. Um, thanks, Ryan. Uh, Frank, any questions? Nope. Pete? Nope. Um, I don't have them either, so thank you for that presentation. Always helpful to understand at this point where things might stand. Um, with that, I think we move to item C on the agenda, and thank you, Ryan, for your participation in meeting today. Um, yeah. So just item C is the discussion of the 2023-2024 LCAP mid-year updates. Uh, Casey? All right. Um, so this um, is the LCAP mid-year update, which is a new requirement. Um, so this is not something that we've shared with the board previously. 
Um, this is a legal requirement based on California Ed Code that requires LEAs to present a report on the annual update of LCAP and the budget overview for parents on or before the end of February, so February 28th each year. And the report must include um, mid-year outcome data related to the metrics identified in our current LCAP, as well as mid-year expenditure and implementation data on all of the actions identified in our LCAP. The purpose of this is to provide the public with an update on the implementation of our current LCAP, um, but also really to make sure that LEAs are aware of um, how the implementation of our current LCAP is going and um, to help us plan for any changes that might need to be made based on revised estimates of revenue, budgeted expenditures, or student performance, um, or any other changes that might happen throughout the year. Um, considerations for the mid-year um, LCAP update, there's no required template. Um, so the template that we're going to show you is one that was put together um, that um, works best with um, Ann Jeanette, who does our consulting um, when helps us with our LCAP. Um, so it works best with looking at where we are with our implementation, but then also preparing us to um, start working on the 24-25 LCAP as well. Um, the board is not required to adopt the mid-year update, so this is just information sharing only. Um, and then the mid-year update is not included or attached to our next year's LCAP at all. Um, however, the information that we have within the mid-year update um, will be used to help develop that LCAP for the following year. So I'll show you quickly our template. So um, the template is um, multiple pages. It starts kind of with the overview of our measuring and reporting of results, and then gets into the actual goals that we have, um, and then each action underneath the goal. Um, with this document, what we're really looking at for the mid-year update is the overall implementation. So where are we in implementing these goals and these actions? Um, and also the total funds that we've budgeted for that action and where we are at this mid-year point in terms of expending those funds. Um, the important thing to know about this is that as we're looking and preparing for the upcoming year, um, we should be at about halfway through spending most of these items. Um, there are some things that might have been funded all within that first half of the year or some things that are going to be funded in the second part of the year. Um, but what is really helpful for us as we're looking at um, these actions and planning for the remainder of the year is we need to make sure that all of our title funds and all of our supplemental and concentration funds are being used. Um, those must be used within the year, um, each year, for the actions that we have um, designated them for. Funding sources outside of that, we can be more flexible with. So as we're looking ahead at next year's budget, if we notice that maybe we had budgeted a certain amount for an action item, but it's not title and it's not SNC funds, um, and so maybe we want to kind of move things around a little bit to better prepare ourselves um, for the remainder of this year or next year, um, we can make those adjustments. But that's the mid-year update. Any, any, any questions, Frank? No, nope. I've seen the document in the Finance Committee meeting. Pete? Not for me. And um, just one question for me. So Casey, it sounds like even though this is an additional administrative burden to fill out, that it, it might actually be a helpful tool to help track the use of the title funds and assure proper expenditure. Absolutely, yeah. Great, it's good that there's an upside to it. All right, um, so I think we're closed on that item. Let's move to item D. Approval and adoption of the Integrated Safe School Plan 2023-2024 for the Marina Del Rey Middle School campus. Uh, Biggie? Do we need a motion first? Indeed we do. Does anyone move uh, the approval and adoption of this item? I'll move. Do I have a second? A second. Okay, moved by Pete, seconded by Frank. Uh, Biggie? 
Um, so this is a very long um, and a comprehensive document that I put in your Dropbox. And um, it just shows how the um, safety is handled on the campus um, and not just our, our safety, but also specifically Marina Del Rey Middle School. So they developed that plan and our um, documents are just a little tiny piece that we um, give them to, um, to put in their um, official document. But since we are located or co-located on their campus, their plan is also our plan. Um, and we need to adopt it or, or approve and adopt it. Um, and um, that's why we're bringing it forward. The plan is pretty much um, almost the same as it is every year for us. We just change um, certain names when it comes to um to responsibilities in the case of emergency. And so do they because um, certain um, staff members change, but overall the, um, the routes where we would e evacuate or the places if we needed to go off campus, where we would have to go, all those things don't really change from year to year. So it's a plan that is very similar every year. Um, but needs to be approved um, every year to do the due diligence. Thanks, Peggy. Um, questions or comments, Frank? Nope. Pete? I guess one question is how this might relate to or not relate to what we just talked about 10 minutes, well, I don't know, how many minutes ago, in terms of our security camera and all that sort of thing. And if that's part of a safety plan, how is this, how is that not in the safety plan? Uh, or um, I, I guess the, the real question is how well do we know, um, how compliant would Marina Del Rey Middle School be to them making a request for this camera or these cameras and all that stuff? Perhaps it goes quicker if it's not us. It's very interesting you mentioned that. So they had cameras later than we did. So for them, because their office building is right where the entrance of the school is, and they, for the longest time, didn't have a camera system. Only we had one because, um, because we had that long hallway from the buzzer gate to the office. But then at some point when, um, when we were at that office building, we saw that they actually already have this this newer system. So I guess they received it when LAUSD kept telling us that they have to include now schools that do not have any of those camera systems. So theirs is much newer than what we have at the moment, but it would be then comparable one once we have ours installed. So it seems to to it to be the 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 reality that they've installed these systems where there were none before. Um, and we just hope that at this point we're very um, much on the top of the list for the installation, um, especially because I've made it very clear that our system has declined in the last few months What when it comes to what you can see. So the, the camera piece has really been um, bad at the, at the last few months. But um, it's a good question. Marina administration is on every email copied on them. And at this point now, I will actually go and see them this week because it seems to be that their approval of that gate, um, so that the one gate is not a gate anymore, but just a fence where they install the camera that is on their um, table now to approve that. So hopefully with their approval, they can expedite um, that we get our new camera. And Quite frankly, they should be also interested in it because they have a few classrooms that are very close to our buzzer gate. And the less well-equipped we are, the more 
is the risk that their students get out of the buzzer gate because we can't see who we're buzzing out. So they are actually interested in helping us. So um, let's hope moving forward that that um, brings us the result that we're hoping for. Sounds good, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I, I agree with Pete. I think, you know, any opportunity we have to leverage or rely upon this, you know, safety and security plan as a tool to request further action or to document our request for action um, regarding, you know, the, the buzzer gate or other things that we might need for security. If there are other innovations we can make in reliance on this plan. We should be taking advantage of those opportunities and then you know, as, as Pete had requested for the other security yeah. conversation we were having, I think that, you know, these are also the kinds of things we want to make sure are documented in email as part of our request, regularly followed up on so that we're, we're showing the diligence from our administration just to, to help get what we think we need in for our community. And then just another question, you know, as I peered through the, the plan, it looks like there are probably some um, it looks like there's some interaction between policies that we have an obligation to maintain as a school um, that we have to, that that are in integration with this. You know, I look at some of the policies that we've um, put into place. Are there other places that we need to make any changes or introduce any new policies or um, anything else that we might have to do to make sure that we remain in compliance with the school and safety plan that we're approving? Not that we know of, but we're looking every year at the policies that we have in place. Um, and for example, um, our fiscal policy is um, pretty old right now. It's um, I think it was last approved in 2018 or 19. So we need to um, bring it back to the board just for, um, um, yeah, so that it's clear that we're looking at these policies right. um, um, in a regular way um, or a regular time. Um, frame. And um, so we also look at what other policies we might need or should have, and we would bring those forward to the board. Great. Okay. Um, all right, let's call, let's move to a vote. Uh, Frank? Yes, that took me a while to find my mute button. Sorry. No problem. Pete? Yes. I approve as well. All right, let's move to new business, next steps, and follow up meeting times. It's in March. Is it March? When is the board meeting in March? I think it, I think it is dated. Um, I'm just looking when the board meeting in March is. I think it's on the 18th. So the next board meeting is 3 18. Um, just so that you can put it on your um, calendars. Great. Do any board members have items to, to make sure we're covering at that next agenda or next meeting? All right. Uh, my them. question my question is, um, Biggie, have we decided that we're going to give a preliminary, prelim, preliminary budget update at that time? What does our calendar say? Um, no. So when we spoke with Ryan and at the, um, at the finance committee, we said we would present one in April, but okay. until March, um, I will be working with Ryan on the expense side because um, Exed has not yet received all the um, um, all what needs to go in the budget model. So mm -hmm. they are still waiting for that template so that he can plug in the. Uh, or that it gives him what the revenue is supposed to be. Um, but definitely we're already working on the expense side. Um, and Casey and I and the leadership team, we will be working on the staffing piece of it because that's obviously a big portion of the expense side. Um, and we will be reaching out to staff members, mainly teachers, what um, supplies they will need for next year so that we can fill those expense um, pieces of the budget working document as we call it with Exet. And then we will also um, make um, um, or, or work on the, the projection of the enrollment 
for next year. And I think what we can bring to the board in March are budget assumptions that we're saying, this is what we are assuming for enrollment. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. what okay. we're assuming in, in a bigger picture, but not yeah. an actual budget. Yeah, and then maybe also think through it. I mean, we have these two open positions, right? Uh, which we, for a while, um, maybe there is a different way, or maybe there's a different idea, you know, of how to fill those in the future. Um, you know, just bounce some creative ideas because it concerns me a little bit that we have these open positions for a while, which goes with goes together with the budget, of course, right? And so I've mentioned that earlier in the in the conversation with the finance committee. So maybe different ideas of how to fill these positions in the future. That's all. Thank you. Thanks. I think it would be good to um, make sure that we have the follow up on the school security item or school safety item on the leadership agenda from ne for next time as well. Yeah. Pete, anything to add from your view? All right. So I see that we have a closed session on the agenda, public appointment executive director. Is this something we're able to do without Yasir and Katra? I just, want, I just wanted to say that I don't think, I mean, you three can discuss if you'd, uh, if you'd like, but um, I think that um, you would need probably Yasir or Katrin or and Katrin um, to give you an update on that. So um, since they are both not here, um, I'm not sure if you want to go into that closed session. Um, Frank and Pete, do we have matters that we should be discussing in closed session tonight? No, I mean, we can only once discuss what's in there and if the right. key, you know, Right, uh, regarding the executive that, director. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you for reframing. No, I don't have anything. You know, I, I'm just waiting for an update. Right, me, me too. Right. Okay. No, yeah, not me. Okay, then we'll right. cancel, cancel and postpone, yeah? Cancel and postpone, exactly. So we are not moving to closed session as framed on the agenda, and we will move to um, adjournment. Mm -hmm. um, so we're removing items uh, Seven, eight, and nine from the agenda. Um, I, does anyone move to adjourn the meeting? Oh, I'll move that. All <laughs> right. So moved by, by Pete. Um, I second. Seconded by Frank. Let's take a vote. Frank? Yes. Pete? Yes. And I approve as well. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.